In today's video, we are out here taking a look at the all new 2017 Honda CRV. Now you might be thinking to yourself, it hasn't been that long since the CRV got a major refresh. Why did Honda redesign it so soon? You might also be thinking to yourself, if it's an all new vehicle, why does it look suspiciously like the previous generation CRV? The answer to both of those questions is actually quite simple. The Honda CRV is very, very important to Honda because Honda sells more CRVs in the United States than all of BMW put together. And it's not by a small margin, it's by 40,000 CRVs. That's right, more than 350,000 CRVs were sold in 2016 in the United States alone. Because the CRV represents such a large portion of Honda's sales, it's important to keep the vehicle fresh, and it's also important that everyone recognizes this as a CRV. As you can see from the front end, this is still instantly recognizable as a CRV. We do have this larger and bolder chrome strip running right across the top that's similar to what we see in the new Honda Civic and the new Honda Accord. And our model has these multi module LED headlamps that we also see in the rest of the Honda line. We are in the top end touring trim, and that's the only model that gets this headlamp design. Although instantly recognizable as a CRV and as a Honda, this looks more rugged than the last generation model, and that was definitely deliberate. For 2017, the CRV is not only wider than it was last year, but it also has 1.5 inches more ground clearance than the previous model. The 2016 CRV was a little bit close to the ground for this category, but the 2017 model is now towards the top of the pack. Fuel economy and active safety were high on Honda's priority list for the new CRV, so we get active grill shutters behind this honeycomb grill right here that helps improve the aerodynamics of the vehicle and improves your highway fuel economy score. We also have a radar adaptive cruise control sensor right in the front of the vehicle because almost every model of CRV will have radar adaptive cruise control. If you get the base LX model, you don't get this feature, but EX trims all the way on up to this two ring trim get their collision mitigating braking system, radar adaptive cruise control, lane keeping, and road departure mitigation. Honda did not go overboard with the stretching of the CRV, so this is not the largest in the category. At 180.6 inches long, this still slots pretty much in the middle of things. This is about four inches shorter than a Nissan Rogue, but about four inches longer than a Hyundai Tucson. Honda's most direct competitor, the Toyota RAV4, is about three inches longer than the CRV overall, but this has more efficient packaging. So we get a little bit shorter hood, but we get a slightly longer body. And that means that even though this is a little bit smaller than a RAV4, we actually have more rear cargo room and just a hair more rear leg room as well. Making the styling a little bit more dramatic seems to have been a definite mission of Honda with the new CRV. We have these tail lamp modules that actually stick out of the body just a little bit. They kind of remind me of an upside down question mark. You can see that we have that very tall turn signal over there on the driver's side. This generation of the CRV is definitely more heavily styled than any generation that I can recall, especially this tail lamp arrangement right here. Although I do think that's the right direction for Honda. This definitely sticks out more in the crowd. Under the hood, we find two different engines depending on which trim level you choose. If you get the base LX trim, you get a 2.4 liter four cylinder naturally aspirated engine that produces 184 horsepower and 180 pound feet of torque. If you get any of the other trims of CRV, then we find this engine right here. It is a brand new 1.5 liter turbocharged four cylinder engine. It's basically the same engine that we also see in the Honda Civic. This engine produces a little bit more power than the naturally aspirated engine, 190 in this trim, and a little bit less torque at 179 pound-feet. However, the important thing about this turbocharged engine is that that torque comes in about 2,000 RPM lower, and the peak horsepower also happens at a lower RPM. That means this is not only faster 0 to 60 than the 2.4 liter four-cylinder engine in the same vehicle, but it also gets slightly better fuel economy, and it's gonna feel just a little bit peppier when you're hill climbing. The highest fuel economy will be found in front wheel drive versions of the CRV with this engine, and the lowest would be in all wheel drive versions with the 2.4 liter four cylinder engine at 27 miles per gallon combined. Front seat comfort is excellent, but very much like we saw under the hood, there's a bit of a differentiation between the base LX model and the other trims of the CRV. If you get the EX trim or higher, then we get the same 12 way power driver seat with the four way adjustable lumbar support that I'm sitting in right here. And this is easily one of the most comfortable seats in this category. This seat gets a 10 out of 10 point score. If you get the base LX trim, then we don't get the power driver seat and we don't get the four way adjustable lumbar support. I would say that probably drops down to around seven out of 10 points. We also have a tilt telescopic steering column with a decent range of motion, a two position seat memory, and the top end models also get a powered passenger seat. Even though the passenger seat is powered in this top end limited trim, it does not have the same range of motion as the driver's seat. 
Thanks to the longer wheelbase we find in the 2017 CRV, we find an incredible amount of rear legroom. This is two inches more than you'll find in a RAV4 and two and a half inches more than we find in the Nissan Rogue. I easily have about eight inches of room between my legs and the back of this seat. The front seat's adjusted for me at six feet tall. I can sit very comfortably back here. Headroom is also very generous in the CRV. I have about two inches of headroom left sitting very upright, even though we are in the model with the optional sunroof. If I scoot all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, this front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I still have about two and a half inches of legroom left. If I move right back here to the middle seat, I still have about two inches of headroom, even though this middle seat is a little bit higher off the ground than the outboard positions. The rear seats feature a two-stage recline function, and they also fold flat with the cargo area in the rear. Now, one thing to note is that the shoulder belt for the center seat position does come out of the ceiling, and that is not my preference because you do have to remove it from the seat unless you want it to be interfering with the cargo. It does take up just a little bit of room back there in the cargo area as far as the ceiling goes. Compact crossovers have really become the go-to vehicle for families, and that should be no surprise because I was very easily able to put these three Graco Classic Ride 50 child seats across the rear bench and have an adequate amount of room. A nice and very rare touch is that we actually have latch anchors for the center seating position in the CRV. Unfortunately, the top tether anchor for this position comes out of the ceiling in the rear of the CRV, not on the seat backs itself like we find in most compact crossovers. This could hamper cargo practicality if you do have a child seat fixed into place and you're using the top tether anchor, which you should always use if possible. The extra length in the CRV didn't just go to the rear passengers, it also went to the rear cargo area where we find 39.3 cubic feet of storage space. That's enough room to put six of these large 24 inch roller bags right into the back. This is about the same kind of room we find in the Nissan Rogue, a little bit more than the Toyota RAV4, which has a very large cargo area for this category and actually the same amount of space that we find in the Ford Edge. And the Ford Edge is a mid-sized two-row crossover, not a compact two-row crossover. As we take a look around the interior, keep in mind we are in the top end touring trim. We have height adjustable seat belts and height adjustable headrests for both the front passengers. The leather seats in this trim are perforated and heated, but they're not ventilated. The front doors are composed of a combination of hard and soft touch plastics. We find soft touch plastics in the upper portion of the door right here in this lighter section of gray, and then we'll find hard plastics lower on the door like we find in most vehicles in this segment, right there around the storage cubby and the bottle holders. There's more attention to detail and you'll find more premium parts in this cabin than in the previous generation of the CRV, and actually most of the entries in this segment as well. That upper door panel is actually an injection molded part made to look like it's stitched. However, this lighter section of the door is actually a stitched component. They actually put two pieces of pleather together and stitch them, as is the armrest right below. That same theme continues on over to the dashboard where we find more of that faux wood trim and more of that injection molded plastic design to look like it has been stitched. We have a black plastic trim strip running right there through the middle to give a little bit of visual interest. And you'll see there are a decent number of shapes going on merging from the dashboard on over to that air vent. The glove compartment is a moderately sized bin style compartment and I was able to fit a large iPad inside. In the center of the dashboard, we have a center channel speaker in this model, two large air vents, and then we have our infotainment and navigation system. This bezel is quite a bit larger than the LCD itself. You'll notice I have Apple CarPlay loaded right now, and this is the size of the LCD right here from this corner right over here to this corner. The overall style of this system is similar to what we see in the Honda Civic, but it doesn't stick out from the dash too much. I suspect that Honda gave us this very large bezel so that way they can give us a larger screen in the future. We have a few touch buttons over here on the left, a home button, map button, audio button, phone button, back button. These operate regardless of whether you're in Apple CarPlay or not. The direct access buttons on the left make it easier to interact with Honda's systems because otherwise we would have to click the manufacturer logo right there to get back to the system that the manufacturer created by default. Below the touchscreen, we find the controls for the dual zone climate control system. We can also get a readout of that in that touchscreen display as well. You'll find the controls for the heated seats right there as well. And then we have our electric parking brake, the brake hold enable disable button, the econ button right over there on the right. And then we have a fairly traditional console shifter. Working our way down from there, we have a small storage bin with a 12 volt power outlet, two large cup holders, and then we have this storage console right here in the center. We have a softly padded center armrest. If we lift that up, the first thing you'll notice is this storage bin right here that is fairly tall and it's also quite long. But we have this divider that can be slid forward and backwards to allow us easier access to what's underneath. That divider can also be completely removed if you want to put larger items in the center console. This is also where you'll find the auxiliary input, USB inputs, and a 12 volt power outlet. 
The instrument cluster in the previous generation CRV was thematically more similar to the Accord than the Civic, but this instrument cluster is a little bit closer to the Civic now. We have these very stylized analog gauges for the engine temperature and the fuel level. And in the center of it all, we have a large LCD that gives us our tachometer and our speedometer. You'll see the tachometer is that line right there across the top, digital speedometer, and of course a transmission mode indicator over there on the left, as well as the eco indicator. This is also where you'll see the status readouts for the radar adaptive cruise control and the lane keeping assistance system. The lower portion of the LCD can be used for a variety of different things like our trip computer information, navigation information, safety system information. You can also get a readout of what the all wheel drive system is doing. So you can see we have the four wheels on the display and there'll be small graphs indicating where the power is flowing in the system. Zooming in even closer, you'll notice that we also have infotainment information and album art even when we're playing from Apple CarPlay. The steering wheel is a three-spoke design with small sport grips up top. You'll find the controls for the infotainment system over here on the left side of the wheel. This button also controls that multifunction display. So we do track forward and backward here, but you can also change the source with the up and down buttons, and then you can move pages on that multifunction display with this little I button. The volume control is both a slider and a toggle, so you can toggle up and down, or you can actually slide your finger right along this up and down as well. The right side of the wheel is where we find the controls for the radar adaptive cruise control that most CRV models will have. We set the distance right over here, enable and disable the system with the main button, and we can turn on and off the lane keeping assistance system with this button right here. The base LX trim of the CRV scored 7.7 seconds, 0 to 60, and that was with a dealer provided model. The turbo model that we're driving ran from 0 to 60 in 7.3. The faster acceleration time in the turbocharged model is thanks to the torque and the horsepower happening at lower RPMs, the torque having a much broader range than in the naturally aspirated engine, and of course the fact that the final drive ratio in this transmission has been tweaked a little bit in order to help give this more off-the-line acceleration. 7.3 seconds is fairly good for this category, although you will find something like a Hyundai Tucson go a little bit faster 0-60, to 60, also the Ford Escape 2.0 EcoBoost. However, surprisingly, the EcoBoost 2.0-liter turbo with considerably more power under the hood only manages to go from 0 to 60 one-tenth of a second faster than this. That puts the turbocharged CRV notably ahead of something like the Nissan Rogue, which runs from 0 to 60 in 8.5 seconds. I mention that because the fuel economy, thanks to this turbocharged engine and the CVT, is actually quite close to the Nissan Rogue, although we are considerably faster 0 to 60. In this top-end touring trim, we stop from 60 miles an hour back to zero in 116 feet, which is very short for this category. You will find slightly shorter stopping distances in some of the competition, but those would be the sport trim, something like the uh, Volkswagen Tiguan with its top-end tire package. That will stop a little bit shorter than this, but this will definitely outbreak something like the Ford Escape in most trims and the Nissan Rogue. When it comes to handling, the CRV certainly feels sharper out on the road than the Toyota RAV4, but not quite as engaging as the sport trim of the Tucson or the top end trims of the Kia Sportage, which are also direct competitors with this. This also won't hold the road quite as well as the Ford Escape or certain versions of the Volkswagen Tiguan. The suspension in the CRV was obviously designed to sit right on the fence between ride and handling because they are two ends of the teeter totter, as I usually say. A firmer suspension is generally going to give you better handling, a softer suspension is going to give you a better ride but sacrifice handling, and this is right in the middle. That's a little bit different than we see in the Honda Civic because the Honda Civic is firm for its segment. It definitely is one of the best handling vehicles in its top end trims, but the CRV relaxes things a little bit in comparison. A lot of that has to do with the fact that, of course, the CRV is a crossover, so this does have mild off roading or gravel roads, snow, that kind of thing in mind. And we do have a taller suspension in this than we had in the previous generation CRV. So, depending on the road surface, this suspension can feel just a little bit softer than the previous gen. That's not to say that this suspension feels like a marshmallow because this isn't that soft. Back out here on paved roads, the balance between ride and handling is very obvious because we have a very smooth, very polished ride. This is definitely the kind of compact crossover you could easily take on a long highway trip and be very comfortable. That's not something you can say of the sportier entries in this segment in general. In terms of cabin noise, we scored 70 decibels at 50 miles an hour, which puts this exactly the same as the 2016 CRV. Even though we have been driving the all wheel drive equipped model, we've been averaging 29 and a half miles per gallon, which is a very good fuel economy score. This is one of the highest combined fuel economy ratings in this segment, both in terms of the EPA score and in terms of our real world driving test. If you want to get better fuel economy than this on your average commute, then you're going to need to get a hybrid in this segment, something like the Rogue Hybrid or the RAV4 Hybrid, because this is going to beat just about every other entry. 
On a one-way journey from San Francisco to San Jose, which is about 60 or 70 miles, at 68 miles an hour, we average almost 40 miles per gallon, which is very, very impressive for a vehicle like this with all-wheel drive. Keep in mind, again, we are in the all-wheel drive equipped model. The important thing to remember when it comes to pricing is that the compact crossover really has taken over from the mid-size sedan as the most important category in the United States these days. There is a great deal of competition and as a result prices tend to be fairly low when you take a look at the kind of equipment that we get standard in every vehicle in this segment. That's why even the base trim of the CRV, which starts just over $24,000, has luxury features that we don't even see in every BMW model in the United States, like active noise cancellation and auto brake hold. Even more important than the base model, however, is the EX trim, which is the biggest seller in the CRV lineup. It's just under $27,000, and just take a look at that long list of feature content that we see in this model. This is the trim where we find the majority of the new features for the 2017 CRV, most notably that turbocharged engine, and of course the much more comfortable driver's seat with the four-way adjustable lumbar support. Now there's a reason the EX trim is such a good value, because every manufacturer in the segment really is fighting for this exact customer, and they're doing it by trying to jam as many features as they can for around that $27,000 price point. Just as we see in the direct competitors to the CRV, the value proposition starts to taper off just a little bit when we start taking a look at the EXL trim and then the Touring trim. The EXL, of course, adds feature content like the power liftgate, leather seats, and a better stereo, but you'll notice that the price difference between the EX and EXL for the feature content is just a little bit larger than from the base model on up into the EX trim. And it's the same thing when we take a look at the Touring trim. This isn't unique to the CRV, of course. You'll find the same sort of thing going on in most of the compact crossovers sold in the US. Now let's talk pros and cons. On the pros side, we definitely have a large backseat area and a very large cargo area. That's quite impressive for the CRV because when you take a look at its overall size, it seems that it should be smaller on the inside than the Toyota RAV4, but it actually ends up being larger. That's just because the Honda is more efficiently packaged. The turbocharged engine is definitely one of the better accelerating vehicles in the segment, but it's not exactly the fastest, so I suppose you could call acceleration a pro and a con. It especially belongs on the con side because the base LX model is going to be definitely slower 0-60 to 60 than the EX trim and above. It's not that the acceleration in the LX trim is bad, it ends up being basically the same as most versions of the Nissan Rogue and most versions of the RAV4, however it's not as exciting as the turbocharged model. On the con side, I suppose you could also say that the rumors that the CRV was going to get an optional third row have proved to be wrong, so we definitely don't have an optional third row available in this vehicle. If you want one, you'll have to step on up to the Honda Pilot. Also on the downside for the CRV, if you want navigation or leather upholstery, you will find those at much lower prices in a number of the competitors in this segment, although we do find Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in the EX trim and above. It's impossible to talk about the CRV without talking about the RAV4, so let's dive right on in to the toughest competitor for the Honda. Both the Honda and the Toyota have long sold on reliability and practicality. The RAV4 is a little bit more expensive at $24,910, but that's mainly because Toyota is also fighting a really hard value game in this segment. They've now put their latest active safety system standard in every model of the RAV4, not just a particular trim and higher, which is what we see in the CRV. And that's mainly why the RAV4 ends up being a little bit more expensive in the lower end trim. However, if you take into account the fact that you do get that autonomous braking system and the radar adaptive cruise control standard, even in the base model RAV4, it actually ends up being significantly less expensive than the CRV. Now we are of course just talking about the base LX trim of the CRV versus the base trim of the Toyota RAV4. Even in the base trim, the CRV is a little bit fresher on the outside, definitely fresher on the inside, and actually roomier inside the cabin again, despite the overall size of the RAV4. We even have a cargo area that's a hair bigger than the RAV4. The RAV4 has always impressed me with the amount of cargo you can put in that CUV. Stepping on up to the EX trim of the CRV and the XLE trim of the RAV4, the two volume trims of these two models, we see a slightly different story. The EX trim of the CRV actually ends up giving you more feature content than the XLE trim of the RAV4, and therefore it ends up being a slightly better value. In addition to that better value, we also get the significantly better performance and better fuel economy thanks to that brand new 1.5 liter turbocharged engine. The value proposition for the CRV over the RAV4 continues as we work our way up the trim ladder. So if we're taking a look at the top end touring trim of the CRV and the top end trims of the RAV4, 
not the hybrid RAV4, mind you, the CRV ends up being a slightly better deal. It also ends up being newer, larger on the inside, a little bit more comfortable, etc. The hybrid version of the RAV4 is quite an interesting option because it will beat the CRV in terms of overall fuel economy, especially if you do a great deal of city driving. The RAV4 Hybrid also happens to be the fastest version of the RAV4. On the downside, you don't get a true mechanical all-wheel drive system, so it's going to be less capable than the regular RAV4 or the CRV when it comes to the snow. The price premium for the hybrid system in the RAV4 is fairly small, so if you're taking a look at the top end trims of the RAV4 and you don't need the most robust all-wheel drive system in that vehicle, I would definitely put that hybrid system on your shopping list over the regular version of the RAV. Next up, we have the Nissan Rogue. Some of you might be wondering why the Rogue is on this list right after the RAV4. The answer is actually that, in a way, it is a more direct competitor to the CRV than the RAV4 because the Rogue is actually beating both Honda and Toyota in terms of sales in 2017 so far. Why is the Rogue the best selling entry in this particular segment at the moment? Well, some of that has to do with the fact that the CRV had a production shortage as they were transitioning from the old model to the new model but the rest of it is all on Nissan's merits. The Rogue is very efficient. It has a low $23,820 starting price. It has an enormous cargo area, and it has a very unique optional third row. Overall, the Rogue is not quite as polished as the CRV, especially this brand new 2017 model, but it is less expensive, and there's now an attractively priced hybrid model. When you compare the EX trim of the CRV to the SV trim of the Rogue, it is going to be about $1,300 more to buy the Honda, but you'll get about $2,300 more standard equipment with it. Again, the Honda sensing system really comes into play here because the radar adaptive cruise control, the lane departure warning, lane departure mitigation, road departure mitigation systems, etc. You can get some of those options in the Nissan Rogue, but you have to step all the way on up to the top model in order to get them. You won't find them in the $26,000 to $27,000 price range. The Ford Escape is one of the best handling entries in this segment, both in terms of overall grip and in terms of overall road feel. On the downside, it is getting a little bit old. Ford compensates for that a little bit by making it one of the least expensive entries in this segment, but not only does it feel a little bit older than the rest, it also feels a little smaller than the rest. You'll really notice that in the cargo area and in the back seat area, where the CRV, the RAV4, and the Rogue feel much larger on the inside. As we've come to expect from Ford, there are a variety of engine options and standalone options available in the Escape. That means it's a little bit more possible to customize your vehicle rather than having fixed trim packages like we see in the CRV. In addition, there is that top end 2 liter turbocharged engine in the Escape, which is an awful lot of fun. However, in terms of just 0 to 60 performance, it ends up only being a little bit faster than the CRV. Some of that has to do with curb weight of the vehicles, but a lot of it actually has to do with the continuously variable transmission in the Honda. I know not everybody is a CVT fan, however they do maximize performance and they maximize fuel economy. That's exactly why we see them in the CRV and in the Nissan Rogue. Last up, we have the brand new 2018 Chevy Equinox. Be sure and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already done so because we will have a first drive review out in about a week or two. After a period of focusing primarily on low pricing, General Motors has suddenly decided to get very aggressive on value and on options. At 23580 the base model of the Equinox will have a 7-inch LCD standard, not optional, and it will also have GM's new 1.5-liter turbocharged engine standard, not optional. When we start taking a look at base feature content, that puts the Equinox a little ahead of the base version of the CRV, and I would say actually approximately equal to the Toyota RAV4. The RAV4 may include their latest active safety system, however, it doesn't give you that turbocharged engine or the 7 inch LCD or number of the other features we see standard in the Equinox. So the value proposition in the base model is quite good in the Chevy. Working our way on up the ladder, the LT version of the Equinox is the approximate corollary to the CRV EX. It is very well equipped, but it does not have radar adaptive cruise control or the active safety systems that we see in the Honda. It's a little bit too early to tell exactly how the value will sort out because not all the details are available on the Equinox yet, but I suspect it will end up being a little bit more expensive than a comparably equipped EX trim of the CRV once you've adjusted for all that feature content that we find in the Honda. On the flip side, General Motors is more than willing to sell you a 2 liter turbocharged engine that is one of the more powerful engines in this particular segment mated to their brand new 9-speed automatic transmission. This is not the same 9-speed that we see in certain Chrysler vehicles or certain Land Rover vehicles, so it's not going to shift like that at all. We'll have a separate video on that transmission as well. 
Also very interesting for the 2018 Equinox, it will be the only diesel in this segment. There will be a General Motors 1.6 liter turbo diesel offered, which should actually equal or beat the Toyota RAV4 hybrid and the Nissan Rogue hybrid in terms of overall fuel economy, especially if your commute is very highway heavy. Again, stay tuned for the first drive review and the full review of the 2018 Equinox. Hopefully I can get my hands on one of those diesel trims, but it's definitely something to keep your eye on in this segment. My overall top pick in the compact crossover group at this time is the 2017 Honda CRV. It's very close, but I would take one over the Nissan Rogue. The Rogue is very comfortable, it's very large on the inside. We have that optional third row, the available hybrid model, etc. But I think that most everything is done a little bit better in the CRV, especially the interior. The interior in the new CRV really does beat the Nissan Rogue in my book. I wish the LCD instrument cluster was perhaps just a little bit larger in the Honda, but the fact that we get one in the EX trim, we get that four-way adjustable lumbar support to make the driver's seat more adjustable, and we get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto in addition to the radar adaptive cruise control and all those other safety systems in that EX trim, it has to be my pick over the Nissan Rogue. That of course makes my runner-up pick in this particular segment the Nissan Rogue, and I would personally pick the hybrid trim of the Rogue, and my can't-go-wrong pick would be the 2017 Toyota RAV4. If you're looking for the absolute best value in the base trim, I might actually say it would be the RAV4 over every other entry in this segment, primarily because of those Toyota active safety systems. If you're looking for active safety in your vehicles, definitely put the CRV and the RAV4 at the top of your list above all the other entries, because again, you'll find those systems in most versions of the CRV and in all versions of the RAV4. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes, and this has been the 2017 Honda CRV. Be sure and find us over at patreon.com to support this channel, over at facebook.com slash alexandautos, and check back with us every week because we should be again getting our hands on that new 2018 Equinox very soon. I'll see you next week.